Hello, and thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Sven Bakland, and I'm Senior Director of Scientific Affairs and Marketing here at Bionana Genomics. And I would like to welcome you to this webinar brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Bionana Genomics. The webinar is called Isolating Ultra High Molecular Weight DNA for Genome Wide Structural Variant Analysis. And it will be presented by Dr. Ben Clifford and by me, Sven Bakland. Bionano has been working on the isolation of megabase sized DNA molecules for over a decade for our optical mapping or genome imaging technology. And we were hoping to share some of that experience with you today. First up is Dr. Ben Clifford, who is our senior field application scientist. He will talk about all the tips and tricks for sample handling and DNA isolation. Then I will take a few minutes to show you some of the things that you can do with that ultra high molecular weight DNA that you just can't do with shorter molecules. And finally, we will answer as many questions as we can. We encourage you to submit as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, just type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. With that, Dr. Clifford, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Bachwin. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Ben Clifford. I'm Senior Field Application Scientist at BioNanoGenomics. And uh, for anybody who is not familiar with BioNano, our platform is uh, pictured here on the title slide. Uh, we have the Sapphire system. Um, and uh, as uh, Sven said, it, is, uh, it does whole genome imaging. Uh, so it's not a sequencing-based approach. It's genome imaging. And the reason that that's important is that genomes are highly repetitive. And so if you look at just a breakout of the contents here of the human genome, uh, only around one-third of it consists of unique sequences. Uh, the other two-thirds are repetitive elements, so lines, signs, transposon, anything else bound in repeats. Uh, and so shorter technologies like uh, sequencing can often get confounded by these repetitive elements and lose context for what uh, an individual read might be covering. Uh, and when we talk about structural variation, we're talking about the largest uh, events in the genome, chromosomal uh, rearrangements or large, uh, oftentimes, events. So here, insertions, deletions, uh, out to inversions, and even translocation at the chromosomal level. Um, and because of the challenges with NGS, uh, for example, the clinical standard of care for some of these largest events uh, has been the karyotype. Uh, but that's uh, slow and not particularly scalable. Um, and so really where we sit is bringing some of the same advantages that sequencing data uh, applies, the scalability and the event detection precision. Uh, and that's where BioNano's data type is uh, particularly valuable. Uh, so here's an image from uh, the Sapphire system. This is showing high molecular weight, long intact DNA molecules in our nanochannel arrays. Uh, that have been labeled and stained with our labeling chemistry. Uh, these fill in uh, for uh, reads, but they are much, much longer. Um, and this approach really requires the long molecules. Uh, in fact, we only carry forward uh, molecules longer than 150,000 base pairs in equivalent, 150 kp. Uh, and this is really what allows BioNano to assemble entire chromosome arms, span these long, repetitive, complex regions that are often confounded by shorter approaches. Uh, in fact, an image here on the right of the slide is uh, some more of our data, and you can even see, visually pick out some repeat uh, uh, motifs. So there's a few strings of labels that are consecutively uh, shown, and uh, we can span uh, most of those regions as well as flanking regions to identify where those repeats uh, exist in the genome. Um, this approach really requires uh, BioNano prep DNA isolation uh, to attain the long, ultra clean DNA. Um, I'm sorry to say, if you have a, a freezer full of DNA that's been archived, that's been isolated from other methods, then frozen, 
uh, it's just going to be too short. Uh, short molecules and impure samples just aren't likely to be informative uh, once they're labeled and imaged in this way. Uh, either they're too, for, uh, too short and that native information uh, from the length is lost, uh, or the prep is too dirty and it won't uh, label efficiently uh, like we need it to and be informative for the downstream assembly process. Um, and so the, the rest of my section is really going to be addressing sample selection, uh, st selected your samples, and gently handling the sample. At the sample and DNA level, uh, those factors are critically important when it comes to prepping this DNA. And uh, what you get in following these best practices, here's a histogram of molecule lengths coming off of the sapphire instrument. Uh, so this is a particularly good run. This uh, was, uh, has a molecule M50, so a center of mass of this size distribution, uh, 434 kb, 434,000 base pairs. Uh, if you look to the left, this red circled area, this is typically what you get with long read sequencing approaches, uh, 20, 30 kb, uh, sometimes a little higher, um, and 50 lengths. Uh, our center of mass is uh, typically much, much higher than that. Uh, really anywhere uh, 250 kb and up is is typical. Um, we, d we will uh, uh, often speak in terms of N50 for where the center of mass of distribution is, uh, although uh, some molecules in the distribution go up past a megabase, even past two megabase, two million base pairs in length. Uh, but what's really uh, informative for our downstream assembly process is where the center of your data set resides in terms of length. Uh, and then just to take uh, a sample that's um, processed through the BioNano prep, uh, if we look at that on a pulse field gel, uh, that really gets at the size even before it hits uh, the labeling chemistry or the instrument. So here's a pulse field gel. These bottom two uh, rows are native DNA that have been isolated uh, via BioNano prep methods. Uh, and the important thing to look at, this uh, rather long ladder uh, goes to 825 kb. If you look at the banding pattern on the bottom two rows uh, before that, there's DNA present in what we call the megabase compression zone. So these isolations contain megabase DNA. Um, the top two rows here are the DLE1 uh, labeled DNA samples that are going on the chip. They also have um, megabase uh, DNA at the compression zone. That's megabases that you're loading into the chip that can then potentially be imaged on the sapphire. Um, and so detecting structural variation really starts with these long DNA molecules. Um, and we, uh, we have a number of uh, protocols um, now using uh, solution phase prep. Uh, our previous um, uh, methodology for this was based in plug lysis. Uh, which I just want to address briefly. This is using an agarose gel plug to provide megabase size DNA uh, and, and uh, physically shield the sample. So what that starts out as is cellular material um, with its native state DNA in it. And then you're providing an agarose gel matrix of protection around it. And from there, uh, there are a series of lysis steps where the cellular material, anything that's not DNA, can be lysed and digested away with proteinase K and lysis buffer. And there, after a series of wash steps, the agarose itself can be melted away. And then you're just left with high molecular weight DNA uh, solubilized. Um, this is not very scalable, however, uh, or very fast. It's, it's a number of... Um, hours and, and an overnight incubation, and we wanted to be a bit faster than that. But the problem with most fast DNA protocols, whether you're using a spin column or magnetic beads uh, or precipitating to the bottom of the tube, is it's just too much mechanical force on this native fragile uh, DNA, and it gets you short reads. So we developed a BioNano Prep SP solution phase DNA isolation protocol uh, that's both fast and mechanically protective of the DNA. Uh, and just to outline how it works, we take uh, a biological material from one tube and then undergo a lysis process. 
and gently release DNA into solution, it's then bound on a magnetic disc where it can be washed on the disc and then transferred to a new clean tube once it is clean and then eluted in an elution buffer. And just uh, to give you a real example of what this looks like, here are a couple of tubes uh, with two black magnetic discs uh, in them. And then each one looks like it's bound up in cobwebs a bit. So uh, this is what the DNA looks like precipitated out of the solution and then bound uh, magnetically uh, to the disc. You have these white wisps that just uh, attach to the disc. Uh, it can all be washed as one unit and then transferred to a new clean tube. Um, and so this process really, uh, it's critically important to handle the sample carefully, uh, store and treat the sample carefully. Uh, we do tend to see our very longest molecules um, with samples that are fresh and have never been frozen, uh, but there are freeze options as well um, for the following uh, sample types, whole blood, bone marrow aspirate, uh, cultured cells, and then uh, new to the lineup, uh, tissue. So we have a solution phase uh, approach in human and animal tissues, tumors, uh, using SP. And then uh, we do have workflows for plants as well. Uh, those are currently uh, supported with agarose plug-based uh, workflows. I'll go through each of these in turn. Uh, so for whole human blood samples, uh, we recommend these be drawn into EDA2. And then uh, there is an option to process that blood uh, same day, uh, fresh without freezing. And what that entails, uh, if you are going to store it for any length of time, that it be stored at four degrees Celsius uh, and then prepped within four days of that initial draw. Um, if uh, that's not possible or if you'd rather store uh, blood and get to it later, there is a freeze option with this workflow. Uh, that would be to mix the original uh, stabilization tube and then make small aliquots, uh, 650 microliters is really all it takes, um, and then place those at minus 80 and um, have those available when you're ready to work with it. Uh, this workflow supported by, uh, shown below, the BioNano SP Prep Blood and Cell Culture Isolation Kit. Uh, there's a similar workflow available for bone marrow aspirate. Uh, now, bone marrow aspirate is a bit challenging. It can be a complex sample type just due to the nature of sample collection. Uh, so we've added a filtration step. Uh, so occasionally there is bone shard, uh, sometimes skin or fat uh, left over in the sample. Uh, so we want to remove all of the crude bulk material uh, and just leave uh, the white blood cells. Another uh, possible complication with bone marrow aspirate is these are collected typically in heparin tubes. Um, heparin, for our purposes as a stabilizer, uh, just does not uh, is not very effective in stabilizing uh, the cells through a freeze thaw cycle. Uh, so what we recommend is to add in uh, a reagent DNA stabilizer, uh, 15 microliters per one ml of crude bone marrow aspirate titrate accordingly if your volume is slightly different. Uh, we see our best results and strongly recommend uh, adding this uh, while the bone marrow aspirate is still fresh before it's frozen and it can be mixed together well. Um, if uh, bone marrow aspirate has been frozen beforehand, uh, quickly upon thawing, you can dose in a, uh, an aliquot of DNA stabilizer. Uh, that will add some benefit. Um, but typically the easiest way to work with this material is to mix it up in DNA stabilizer and make one ml aliquots, which then can be placed at minus 80. Uh, this uh, workflow is supported by the BioNano Prep SP Bone Marrow Aspirate DNA Isolation Kit, which includes those filters and uh, the extra DNA stabilizer. Uh, cultured cells are also uh, quite readily handled. Um, if you're electing uh, to work with these fresh uh, cells in culture, uh, the culture should be high viability. Uh, ideally, it's actively growing, um, in which case you would simply count out 1.5 million human cells and begin the protocol. Uh, so you'd carry the volume equivalent of 1.5 million forward after uh, doing a cell count. Uh, this 1.5 million figure, uh, this is to target 9 micrograms of DNA equivalent going into the reaction. More on that in just a second. Um, there's also a freeze option 
uh, with cultured cells. Uh, if you have uh, cells in culture and you'd rather freeze them down into pellets, that's certainly possible. Uh, you'd simply count out your desired uh, input and then wash again in this DNA stabilizer um, to promote viability in those cells uh, upon freezing them and thawing them back out. You'd pellet the uh, material once it's been washed in stabilizer and then place those tubes at minus 80. And this uh, workflow is supported by the same kit as the whole blood, the BioNano Prep SP blood and cell culture isolation kit. Now, each of these uh, three workflows that I've described, blood, bone marrow, and cell, uh, have a number of commonalities that I want to address just to get into the, the mechanism a bit more specifically. Uh, in each one, the cells at some point are counted to 1.5 million uh, human cells as the target input. Uh, this translates to uh, an input of nine micrograms of DNA equivalent of the material. Uh, we like nine micrograms as a target as that uh, that provides enough material to have a good DNA yield, uh, a target uh, concentration of the solubilized sample once you have it uh, as output. Uh, but it's not an excessive amount of material. Um, it's less than 650 microliters whole blood, uh, for example, um, and really minimizing unnecessary input is helpful uh, for the efficiency in the wash steps. So you're uh, minimizing how much uh, there is to wash out. Uh, in every case, cell viability is really key. Um, if the cells are uh, inviable in a significant degree, if nucleases are already attacking that DNA, uh, you're going to see shorter molecules once you get to the labeling and, uh, and running the sapphire. Um, and so for electing the freeze options here, that's where stabilizing the sample properly really comes in. And then once uh, any frozen sample is frozen at minus 80, uh, samples really must not go undergo any freeze-thaw cycling. Um, so those are freeze-thaw cycles just represent iterations of a damage uh, to the DNA. Uh, now I mentioned at the outset, uh, we have uh, early access uh, kits and workflows available for uh, human and animal tissue. Uh, just to go into that briefly, uh, we were seeing good results with um, 10 milligram and up of flash frozen uh, tissue or tumor. Uh, unfortunately, uh, FFPE samples are uh, not adequately preserved and uh, won't work on our platform. Um, but once the uh, desired mass of tissue is harvested, uh, it's simply a matter of rinsing it and quickly snap freezing in liquid nitrogen uh, upon harvest. Uh, you don't need a storage medium. Um, uh, we don't recommend using any kind of storage medium outside of just snap freeze and liquid nitrogen. Uh, let that gas off, cap the tube, handle it on dry ice until uh, the sample can be transferred to minus 80. Um, this uh, workflow is, uh, again, in early access. It's uh, supported by the BioNano SP Prep Tumor and Tissue DNA Isolation Kit. Um, if you are interested, uh, in, in this workflow or in any of our workflows, please contact us. Uh, and then we have a number of workflows available for uh, plant tissue as well. Uh, so each of these start with harvesting uh, anywhere between 0 0.5 and uh, maybe 2 grams of fresh growth from young plant leaf tissue as input. Um, with plants, each, each one can be very different, but uh, one commonality is you really want to target young, uh, fresh plant leaf tissue. Uh, mature plants, um, leaves that have grown a lot of structural uh, compounds or metabolites, uh, secondary metabolites in the tissue, um, are likely to lead to dirtier preps, lower DNA yields. Um, the, the fresher you can get, the better with these. Uh, we have a number of workflow options to support different uh, plant compositions and uh, metabolite content. Uh, our workhorse protocol is a protocol that works well for most uh, straightforward plant tissues. There are separate workflows uh, specific to secondary metabolite content, a high polyphenol um, workflow as well as high polysaccharide, if those are uh, issues to be concerned about with your particular plant sample.
Uh, as with uh, the other workflows, uh, fresh works great, in which case you just harvest the tissue and then start straight away homogenizing fresh plant tissue. If you're not ready to get to that same day, there's freeze options here as well. Uh, you'd harvest the tissue, uh, free weigh it out, and then uh, snap freeze in liquid nitrogen. Again, no storage media really necessary to do this. Uh, just snap freeze in liquid nitrogen, let that gas off, and then transfer a sample to minus 80 until you're ready for it. Um, if, uh, if the sample is uh, frozen at this point, um, there is also a workflow option to homogenize the sample entirely in liquid nitrogen. Um, this is just pulverizing it down into a powder and then uh, using a weighed powder to carry forward into the DNA isolation reaction. Um, these workflows are all supported by the Bionano Prep Plant DNA Isolation Kit. Uh, again, this is an agarose-based method. Uh, plug lysis, and uh, there's a protocol selection guide if you're not sure where your plant falls that will help you differentiate between whether uh, it's better to use base, high polyphenol, or the high polysaccharide option. So the output from any of these processes is solubilized ultra-high molecular weight DNA. Uh, and then working with this and preserving that native length that you've worked so hard to attain uh, entails a few extra care steps as well. So if you look at the picture on the right, this is what a high molecular weight DNA sample looks like. The first thing you'll notice is the texture is very different. Uh, the sample is viscous. So uh, it's, it's a bit even just like pipetting hair gel. Uh, there should be some texture and viscosity to it. Um, any of the SP workflows end uh, the isolation protocol on a slow end-over-end -end DNA rotation uh, to gently promote some mechanical mixing, and then that sample is incubated overnight, at least overnight, uh, at room temperature. Um, returning to it the next day or, uh, or a couple days down the line, um, it's critical to pipette slowly and very carefully and really to work with the viscosity. So realize it's not going to be um, a uniform subsample when you pipette it, just need to, uh, need to work with it. You never want to vortex the sample. Uh, that will shear your DNA uh, systematically. Uh, and then it's uh, strongly uh, recommended to keep wide orifice tips on hand. So in this picture, um, technicians using a wide bore P200 tip, the orifice in the tip is wider uh, and that's to minimize any shearing of uh, just the sample migrating in and out of the pipette tip. Um, that's what we recommend for uh, mixing uh, prior to any subsampling for DNA quantitation or labeling uh, this DNA. Um, and then the gDNA that you do recover from this process uh, should be kept fresh. You should never uh, freeze it. The ice crystals will uh, shear the DNA. Um, Storage at room temperature is just fine. Uh, if you're going longer term, uh, storing the sample at 4C also works. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind uh, with these viscous DNA samples is that the DNA uh, within them is often heterogeneously distributed. So the viscosity in the sample really is molecular interaction of high molecular weight DNA, long strands, uh, interfering with one another and providing a, a viscous um, texture to that sample. Uh, and that implies, and uh, is often the case, that the sample is really quite heterogeneously distributed. When it comes time to quantitate that DNA, uh, what we do is three sample aliquots uh, per tube, small aliquots, two microliters, uh, to quantitate using fluorimetry. And we do need a fluorimetric approach. Um, uh, to get this quantitation accurately. And then from those three, assessing the mean and uh, the coefficient of variation. And just to illustrate some of the challenges in, uh, in doing this, uh, here's an example um, of three different aliquots of, of uh, DNA from the same tube. So spatially different positions. Uh, you can take from the left, center, and right of the sample just to ensure you're not hitting the same spot three straight times. Uh, three different readings from a same tube might look like 65, 100, and 120 nanograms per microliter. 
uh, that's real variation uh, within that sample. Uh, if those were your three readings, uh, what you'd do is take the mean concentration of those three. Here it's 95 nanograms per microliter. And then of those three, assess the coefficient of variation, so the standard deviation divided by the mean. Um, we uh, require a coefficient of variation 30% or below uh, to have confidence in the initial three aliquots that went into this reading. Uh, so they need to agree within 30% or so of one another uh, before having confidence in the mean. Uh, if uh, the DNA is incubated overnight, and then three aliquots are subsampled, and they uh, are wider than 30% in coefficient of variation. Um, that's not a static metric by any means. Uh, the, the cure for that is simply just to let the DNA incubate longer at room temperature. What happens then is it gives the DNA time uh, to diffuse apart and homogenize the sample. Some gentle mixing there with a wide bore tip is also an option. Uh, but just to underscore where these processes leave you, um, you end up with a very high ultra-pure molecular weight DNA isolation. Uh, the initial input target was 9 micrograms uh, DNA equivalent, uh, and that's typically output in about 120 microliters of volume, uh, which represents solubilized ultra-high quality uh, DNA that you can carry forward for labeling. The typical concentration, the target that we, we aim for with that 9 microgram input is 35 to 150 nanograms per microliter in mean concentration. Uh, once you're at that point, if you're uh, doing the bio-nano workflow, um, it only requires 750 nanograms of DNA carried forward to be used in the direct label and stain reaction for running in the chip. So we're producing uh, quite an excess of, uh, of DNA that is actually run in the instrument. And with that, I'd like to hand things back to Sven to talk a bit more about the platform and structural variation in genetic disease and cancer. Sven. Yes, thank you, Ben. Um, I would like to um, <laughs> start by summarizing a few things that Ben said, and that is really that one of the reasons why we are all here and and are interested in these very long DNA molecules is that the genomes uh, of any complex organism are just really highly repetitive. In human genomes, only about a third consists of unique sequences and two thirds consist of repeats. And what's important here is that if you have a short read length because you have short molecules, but also because you're using a method like NGS to look at the genome, you just cannot make sense of two thirds of the genome because um, almost all of the classes but all of the single units of these different repeat element classes are already uh, longer than the length of short read sequencing. So making sense of that is impossible. And even with long read sequencing, uh, you're still not uh, able to make it through some of these long repeat arrays here. And that's why the standard of care in the clinic uh, is not long read sequencing. It's not uh, high coverage Illumina, but to look at structural variants, people look with a microscope at intact DNA molecules. And when NGS came along, there was this idea that all of this could be replaced with short read sequencing, but the truth is that an NGS protocol starts by fragmenting the DNA. You take a perfectly intact genome and you shred it. And that makes no sense. It's the same idea of trying to tell you how many pieces of kiwi were in this blender after I turn it on and make a smoothie. It just doesn't make sense. So we want long intact DNA, and that is uh, what this seminar, of course, is all about. That's why the standard of care in the clinic is still looking at intact DNA molecules and looking at patterns on these molecules, and that's exactly what BioNano does. Uh, we place about a thousand times more labels on these molecules uh, than you can see with a karyotype, and we massively parallel image and linearize these DNA molecules in our nanochannels array. Our microscope is called Sapphire, and it automates the labeling, uh, the, sorry, the imaging of these molecules. Now, this is how it all works. This is the workflow for optical mapping with BioNano. Uh, ben talked extensively about the isolation part of high molecular weight DNA. Uh, next up, then, is labeling a specific sequence motif across the entire genome. We do this with a single enzymatic reaction that places a label at a single six base pair sequence motif occurring all throughout the genome 
about 500,000 times, so once every 6 kb on average. Once that labeled DNA is loaded onto our subfire chips, we will use electrophoresis to move the molecules into the nanochannels and image them and do this over and over and over again. The images that are collected will then be digitized and the uh, digital representation of each of the molecules will be extracted. And then our software will perform a complete de novo assembly of the entire genome, meaning that every single molecule that we image will be aligned with every single molecule that we image. And so out of these patterns that we find in these overlapping molecules, we build consensus genome maps that represent the structure of the genome. And then we can call every type of structural variant simply by comparing these patterns. In each of the examples here, the reference genome of your choice is in green and your sample is in blue. And you see on the left that a gain or a loss, so a deletion or an insertion is detected by the spacing between the labels, decreasing for a deletion or increasing for an insertion. With BiNano, we can call those starting at 500 base pairs. We can look at repeat arrays. I will show you some examples of that in a second, either by counting the repeats or by measuring the distance between the flanking labels. We can detect tandem duplications by seeing a pattern present twice next to each other, either direct or inverted, starting at 30 kb. On the top right there, you see a translocation, which we detect when the de novo map in blue aligns for half with one chromosome and half with another chromosome or a different part of the same chromosome. And then last, bottom right, an inversion is detected when a pattern is simply flipped around in place uh, starting at 30 kb. Our software will show you all the structural variants that we detect in a figure like this, which is called a circus plot. You see translocations in the middle, magenta, and then the concentric circles show you copy numbers, deletions, inversions, duplications, etc. Now, if you click on any of these structural variants, we will show you a zoomed in map that shows you exactly the alignment of that structural variant with a reference. And you can even show the molecules that were used to call that structural variant. Now, if you don't want to use with our software, you can simply export these structural variants as a VCF file after filtering and use any software of your choice. Now, what makes BioNano unique compared to long-read sequencing technology is really the enormous amount of data that we can collect in a short amount of time. Our chips have three flow cells, so you can map three genomes at a time. And the instrument can collect the 100x coverage, which we recommend for structural variation calling in genetic disease, uh, on nine human genomes per day per instrument. Or if you want to collect more data, you can run them longer and collect as much as 400x coverage, which we recommend for cancer. And I'll tell you in a minute uh, what we do with that. We can run the instrument even longer and collect 1600x coverage of three human genomes in just three days on average an enormous amount of data. And keep in mind that the cost per genome, if you have an instrument, is just about $450 for that. So 1,600x, $450. I think if you work with long read sequencing, you immediately understand that uh, there's an enormous gap there in what we can deliver uh, compared to other methods. So I wanna walk you through a few examples of structural variants that were detected with BioNano that were missed with other methods, short read and long read sequencing. And I will start first with some genetic disease research cases. What you're looking at here is a part of chromosome 16 in a patient with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. That's a severe genetic disorder, a birth defect that affects uh, the diaphragm and the lungs, sometimes the heart. And very little is known really about the uh, genetic basis of that. So at Mass General Hospital, a team used BioNano to look at this case where a microarray had detected a two megabase duplication. Now, if you look on top of that figure, you see a copy number profile, and our copy number profile shows actually two duplication events. And then when we look at our maps, the patient map is in blue, the reference is in green here. You can see that we can show you the exact structure of this event. There's actually two duplications. The first one is direct, the other one is inverted and falls in between uh, the first two um, duplications. We highlighted the genes that are affected by these events, and those are all new candidate genes for this disease. They could not make sense of this region uh, with sequencing. Mark Ebert from the Mayo Clinic used our technology to look at the C9 or F72 gene 
uh, which can cause Alzheimer's disease if there's an expansion of a GG, GG, CC repeat. That hexonucleotide repeat is, of course, all GC, 100% GC, and so these expansions of that repeat are impossible to sequence through. Uh, Mark tried to do this with uh, nanopore sequencing and, of course, short read sequencing as well and failed. Here you see that in a single brain biopsy of a patient uh, who died of ALS, uh, we can see these different alleles, these different expansions of that repeat from wild type all the way to 32 uh, KB. And, um, and there's, of course, an enormous amount of power in being able to detect that mosaicism in the brain. There's another one that you cannot sequence with short or wrong read sequencing. It's a disease called FSHD, fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy. It's a genetic disorder that affects the muscles of the face the upper arms and the back. And it has a very odd genetic mechanism. It is caused by repeat contraction, a contraction of a repeat subtle American chromosome 4, which is labeled here in this figure as D4Z4. You see a wild type on top, and you see a diseased allele at the bottom where you see contraction of that repeat. This repeat is uh, in a healthy person up to 300 kb in length. BioNano can span that repeats with single molecules. That is really our strength, our mega base size molecules. And so we can size that perfectly in single molecules. And we can also distinguish between the pathogenic and the non-pathogenic allele, which is labeled 4QA and 4QB here. Segmental duplications or low copy repeat LCRs, as they're labeled in this figure, are very, very large blocks of the genome that are repeated multiple times. Uh, they're typically 50 to hundreds of KBs in length, and they can have, um, they can be um, blocked together in blocks as large as a megabase or so. BioNano can span these segmental duplications with single molecules, and so a team at Emory University used our technology to look at inversions flanked by segmental duplications. In the 3Q29 deletion syndrome, a large one and a half megabase section that is labeled in this figure as canonical deletion is deleted and causes the disease. But this team want to find out uh, if uh, inversions in the parents in that region can predispose to this disease. Uh, they tried to do this with just about every molecular method that exists, but only with BioNano they were able to detect these inversions because we have molecules that span the 350 KB inversion and both segmental duplications that flank it uh, on single molecules. Mark Ebert again at the Mayo Clinic has talked in uh, several papers about camouflage genes. These are genes that have uh, often repeating exons that uh, make them impossible to be analyzed by NGS. At the bottom there in orange, you see the read depth from whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing uh, for this gene, and you see that it drops to zero for the um, binding domains of this gene, again, because there are variably repeated binding domains in that gene. This gene is very important for Alzheimer's disease, and with BioNano on top there, we were able to call a deletion in this gene in a patient who died of Alzheimer's disease, uh, even though uh, the repeats there make it impossible to access them with sequencing. Now in cancer, whether you're using heme, studying heme malignancies or solid tumors, we really have a great advantage over these other technologies, and that is, I mentioned before, that we can collect as much as 1,600 X coverage per sample uh, for the same price. With that, we can dig very deep inside a complex heterogeneous tumor and detect structural variants that are present at just 1% allele fraction. No other technology can do this in an unbiased genome-wide uh, manner. And so two examples from cancer samples here is a uveal melanoma sample uh, that is characterized by uh, typically a loss of expression of uh, gene 1. Uh, this is a, a result from the Curie Institute in France. Uh, in this particular sample, they found no genomic explanation uh, for this lack of expression. But BioNano was able to detect a deletion of 740 base pairs right in the promoter region of this gene. Now, we plotted the GC content there underneath, and you see that right at the site of that deletion, the GC content goes up to about 80%, and that made it invisible to uh, the methods of whole genome sequence that they used. 
Here's another example from the Cordelier Institute where they studied hepatocellular carcinomas. On the left there, you see the circus plot of a tumor that showed no replication stress. You see a few translocations and a very stable copy number profile. And on the right, you see a sample that looked identical under the microscope but had an enormous amount of replication stress. You see a massive number of translocations and also a highly abnormal copy number profile. Now, the difference between these two was the insertion of the hepatitis by hepatitis B virus uh, just upstream of the cyclin E1 gene, which you see in the map on top there. Uh, we call this um, insertion. And so the promoter of the hepatitis virus will turn on that cyclin gene. The cell cycle uh, will continue uh, out of control before the DNA replication has happened, and that causes that signature. This is an important uh, measure, this uh, signature of replication stress, uh, because it may qualify this patient for the use of um, ARP inhibitors. And then last, I want to touch for just a, a second on cytogenomics, because in cytogenetics right now, um, we use decades or, or even half a century old technologies, karyotype, fish, chromosomal microarray. And a recent study that was just published from Radboud University in Nijmegen used Bionano to look at 48 leukemia genomes and found that Bionano can uh, call all the variants, so 100% concordance with the standard of care. That means all the variants picked up by karyotype and by fish and by array in all 48 samples combined. Many sequencing-based methods have tried and failed to replace traditional cytogenetics, but Bionano can. And the advantage here is that you can replace a very uh, confusing, to be honest, workflow that you see on the left, where depending on the tissue type, you end up with cell culture or not, cell separation or not, different methods of DNA extraction and of uh, labeling and of amplification and of harvesting and hybridization uh, to come up with a number of different results that then need to be integrated. All of this can be replaced with a single workflow where you have a universal DNA extraction independent of the sample type as then discussed with RSP kits, and then one instrument generates the data um, that gets analyzed all together. So I want to end here by summarizing that we call uh, structural variants starting at 500 base pairs genome-wide with extremely high sensitivities, up to 99%, and PPVs uh, starting at 97%, so uh, almost no false positives. And then in cancer, we can collect 1,600x coverage per sample. That brings us down to 1% allele fraction. All of this just starting at $450 if you own an instrument. But that's not the only way to get Bionano data. You can, of course, get the Sapphire system shown on the right there. You can also uh, take part in a reagent rental model where with the commitment of just 120 genomes at $550, we will get you a Sapphire instrument to use. Or we also have an in-house service where you simply send us your samples and we will get you the data back. And we are uh, up and running uh, even right now during these times. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and address some of the questions um, that we've received. And I will start uh, to ask Ben a question about size selection. Is there any site selection mechanism of the disk uh, at all, Ben? Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sven. Uh, is there any size selection of the disk? Uh, no. The, um, the, the disk is introduced once the, the input material has been lysed, and then megabases of DNA uh, diffuse in, into the solution. Uh, the disk simply captures what's there. So it's not meaningfully uh, performing any size selection. Another question, Ben, will the magnet affect the DNA in any way? Uh, so the, the DNA binds to the magnetic uh, disk. Um, it's, it's not a pull in opposite directions like you can see with bead-based uh, approaches. It's just uh, a one uh, magnetic disk with a microstructure that enables the DNA to bind to it out of solution. Uh, so it's, it's not exhibiting the, the mechanical force of, of other approaches. I'll stay on the disk here. Um, the magnetic disk that allows binding of DNA resembles circulomics nanobind disk. Is that uh, the same composition, or what's the difference in the protocols? Uh, 
Uh, that's right. So it's, uh, it, it is the same composition, but they are uh, different protocols. So um, uh, we have partnered uh, with Circulomics and developed uh, workflows specific uh, to our, our needs of, uh, of DNA uh, purity and um, develop the workflows and uh, specific chemistry uh, around the uh, BioNano Prep SP uh, DNA isolation. Great. We have a few questions about yield. Um, the extraction with 650 microliters of blood in, uh, will yield a very low final yield. Um, it may be long reads, but not enough DNA for multiple reads. What is the typical yield of 650 microliters of blood? That's right. So uh, just I'll take that one step by step. So 650 microliters of blood, um, a, a small sampling of that is, uh, is used to determine a white blood cell count. Uh, and then from there, the volume equivalent of 1.5 million white blood cells is carried forward. Um, so, so that's really a, a commonality between cell, blood, bone marrow aspirate. Uh, we use 650 microliters because that's um, uh, a pretty conservative high volume of blood, um, whole human blood from uh, healthy normal patients, uh, anywhere from 250 microliters to maybe up to 500 microliters uh, will get you that 1.5 million. Now, if... Um, if there's any any factor where the white blood cell count would be abnormally low, uh, you could simply uh, potentially titrate a different volume uh, just so long as you can isolate uh, 1.5 million uh, white blood cells. And then uh, once you've started at that common uh, point, uh, you, you proceed through the isolation and then uh, the target output is uh, anywhere from 35 to 150 nanograms per microliter in concentration. Great. Somewhat related question. Uh, a scientist here stores frozen blood samples in 1 ml volumes. Can we scale up from the recommended 650 microliters? Um, potentially, sure. So uh, in that case, um, if, if you wanted to follow the workflow to a T, uh, you would simply take that one ml uh, subsample and, and from it see what volume equivalent gets you 1.5 million uh, white blood cells. Um, and then you'd, you'd simply have uh, an excess of, uh, of blood that you could use uh, toward whatever other purpose. Yeah. How do you quantitate this kind of DNA? What method is used? Great question. So uh, quantitation, uh, we, we just need some fluorometric approach. Uh, so in, in the field, uh, typically we'll use uh, the qubit fluorimetry. Um, that uh, picogreen works as well. Um, uh, an approach um, uh, like nanodrop isn't going to be precise enough, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, is there any difference between high molecular weight DNA and what we are calling ultra high molecular weight DNA? Uh, for human blood samples, do the separation techniques differ between these above mentioned two molecular weight DNA? Uh, no, um, no. So uh, there, there's not meant to be a difference in in terminology. There, uh, DNA is. Um, uh, it, we we want it as high molecular weight as uh, as we can get it. I think what I can add here, um, maybe Ben, is that um, many DNA isolation kits claim that they isolate high molecular weight DNA, and you get molecules that are maybe uh, 30 to 50 kb in length. And I think the difference is that um, at BioNano we require or want megabase size molecules. Uh, that's where that distinction falls, uh, I believe. Mm. Does the DNA isolation protocol work for single-stranded DNA? Uh, no. So the uh, the output is uh, around a target of nine micrograms uh, double-stranded DNA. Yeah. Similar questions for viruses. 
uh, does the protocol work for DNA isolation from viruses? Uh, so, so viral genomes are going to be uh, much smaller uh, than the, the target molecule length uh, for bio-nano prep. Uh, so we haven't uh, explored whether it could work uh, in principle, um, but you know, much of the benefit would, would likely be lost. Okay. We have uh, quite a few questions here, so I will just keep going, if that's okay with you, Ben. Uh, the grinding sure. of plant tissues isn't affecting DNA fragment length at all. Uh, methods like chopping the tissue may be better. Is the grinding fra uh, affecting fragment length? Yeah, let me uh, let me put up my plant slide again. That that's a very good question. Uh, so I mentioned a few uh, separate workflows that we have uh, for plant tissue. Um, if if it's processed fresh and kept that way. Um, each of the three shown here, the base, the high polyphenol, and the high polysaccharide, uh, those use chopping uh, to uh, homogenize the plant tissue, uh, and then that's uh, uh, processed through a plant homogenization buffer, which releases the nuclei. Um, that uh, is certainly one option. Uh, liquid nitrogen grinding is a separate one. I'd, I'd recommend it if the plant tissue were stored uh, frozen. If, if it's already been frozen, um, you may as well keep it that way in liquid nitrogen uh, for the duration of homogenizing it, uh, in which case it's easiest to grind. Um, we, we see that it's more important really to keep uh, a lot of liquid nitrogen around and to keep refilling and uh, and keep that tissue cold during the grinding process. Um, if it's spiking in temperature as you're grinding it, that uh, that will have an impact. Um, but if if the liquid nitrogen, if there's plenty of it, and uh, you're able to grind it away, it's it's sometimes necessary if the plant tissue is uh, is particularly tough. Um, or you know, or otherwise, but really there there is an option if there's a concern about uh, treating the tissue too rough. Uh, you could it certainly elect to chop it, um, but in the realities of plant tissue is uh, it's it's tough leaves sometimes, uh, and and the grinding could be a benefit just to get through it. Great. Another question here: What is the maximum time after tissue snap freezing uh, for high quality genomic DNA to be able to be recovered? Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, we, uh, to, to my knowledge, haven't looked at this uh, systematically. Um, I think the, the ultimately important uh, thing is that it be snap frozen and then kept at minus 80 without freeze thaw cycles. Uh, really, at that point, I I would imagine it comes down to particularity is of of that sample and and of your freezer maintaining that temperature. Uh, somewhat related, how should I keep high molecular weight genomic DNA after extraction uh, from a cell in four degrees or at room temperature? How long I, can I keep it in ideal conditions? Sure. Uh, so great, great points both, great options both to keep it at room temperature or 4C. Uh, the important thing is you, you don't want to freeze it once, once the DNA is solubilized. Um, you know, just uh, as a workflow convenience, um, typically our, uh, our users are turning that sample over into labeled DNA and then running it out on a chip pretty promptly. Uh, if you do want to store it, Room temperature is uh, is fine, um, maybe out for a couple weeks. Uh, anything longer term than that, um, you can put it at 4C, but it's it's pretty user electable in practice. Great. Um, we have a few more questions about the SV calling uh, that I can take. What's the repeat expansion detection sensitivity? Now. Um, it's an interesting question because we can automatically call structural variants starting at 500 base pairs. Uh, we cannot see very, very small expansions or contractions of repeat. So if you just have a few um, copies of a trinucleotide repeat, we cannot detect that. 
So uh, the type of uh, repeat expansion genes that we can detect are the ones that are larger and that typically fail with PCR. So there's some good complementarity there. That is uh, fragile X, myotonic dystrophy, ALS, and a number of other ones. So if the difference between the wild type allele and the expanded allele uh, is more than several hundred base pairs, we will be able uh, to detect that. Another question here. Uh, it says the starting size of SV detection is 50 kb, but what is the range of SV sizes? So a little correction there. We call structural variants starting at 500 base pairs. Uh, it's on the screen right now, actually, for deletions and insertions. For some of the other structural variants where we need to be able to detect a pattern, like in a translocation uh, that needs to align with the genome, uh, it's a 50 kb minimum. The range of SVs that we can detect goes all the way from 500 base pairs to entire chromosomes. We detect aneuploidies, so chromosome arm deletions or duplications, entire chromosomes, and any, anything uh, shorter than that can be detected with a copy number tool and also um, with our maps, again, as you can see here. Another question here, can this method detect mosaics? Yes, absolutely. Um, we talked about a 1% allele fraction, uh, so we can detect um, mosaic samples absolutely surely. Uh, depending on the amount of coverage that you can get, we can go as, as low as 1%. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yes, we have uh, plenty of examples of mosaic cases for FSHD uh, for a number of other genetic diseases. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left. We'll maybe um, answer two more questions. I am aware of advantages of these long read sequencing platforms, but it comes with major limitations of high error rates, around 50% in case of like bio nanopore. How accurate is optical mapping reads as compared to Sanger or Illumina? What is the error rate you have observed in general? It's a bit of a complicated question, uh, of course, because we're comparing sequencing methods where you read the A, C, Gs, and Ts with a method like ours that just calls the structural variants uh, by looking at these changes in label patterns. So yes, for nanopore sequencing, the error rate is, is uh, about the range that you uh, called. For PacBio, it's actually a lot lower. I think the main difference between our technology and sequencing-based methods is that we are the only technology that can call these structural variants genome-wide, unbiased, with this very high sensitivity. So it's not a fair comparison because we don't give you single base pairs. Uh, we can show you these smallest variants. But when it comes to structural variants, there's just no comparison in our performance versus uh, the long read sequencing platforms. And there's actually quite a few neutral studies, like from the Human Genome SV Consortium, that prove that. I think that is all the time we have. Uh, any questions that we were not able to address um, during the live period will be addressed by uh, Ben Clifford or me if you had a contact information that you provided when you registered. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Ben Clifford for his time today and all of you for joining. Uh, we want to thank LabRoots for organizing today's educational webcast as well. Uh, on the top left in the resources tab, you have access to our Sapphire platform brochure and our SV white paper. And please contact us at info at bionanogenomics.com with any questions that you may have. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Uh, LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you that you share this with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. There's a survey that will pop up on your screen right now. We appreciate your participation. And uh, with that, thank you. And until next time, bye-bye.